morning, Lionhearts. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said well. I had a great night's sleep. Of course, I was here at Hank Snow's property for almost a half a century. 44 years he lived here. It was the Rainbow Ranch. Awesome experience. But today, we're going to take off and we're going to do kind of a sad vlog. We're going to talk about a man named Stringbean Aikman. And Stringbean was a member of Hee Haw, he was a member of the Grand Old Opry, and he lived here in a day where nobody really felt the need to lock their doors. It was a safe place out here in Madison, actually it was Goodlettsville, and nobody ever had a concern. In fact, Stringbean at one time was quoted as saying he could leave a bucket of money on his porch, go on tour, come back, and not a dollar would be missing. And unfortunately, one evening, Everything changed that, and everyone that felt safe out here didn't feel safe anymore. Today we're going to talk about the murder of Stringbean and Estelle, and what ended up happening afterward to the people that perpetrated this murder. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. And thanks to your friends for inviting me back. I can't wait to stay here again. I sure am going to miss this place. And of course I had to come back and say goodbye to the Rainbow Ranch Barn. Don't be sad, Barn, I'll be back. I'm just still moving on. So Tim Kuba, this is your Patreon sunglass vlog. We're gonna head off to downtown Nashville where this whole evening began, 1973, the Ryman Auditorium. All right, 65 south to Nashville. That's what we want. So we're down here in downtown Nashville, right off Music Row. Couldn't help but stop in Ernest Tubb Record Shop. I had to. I didn't get to last time I was here. Well, here we are at the Ryman, but I want to go over to the other side. There's a statue of someone that has to do with a little bit of this story. Now, Stringbean Aikman was born in Kentucky and eventually became one of the most well-known banjo comedians there was. Now, he ended up trading two of his prized chickens for his first banjo, started performing around town at different dance halls, and then eventually went and did a talent show. Asa Martin couldn't remember his name, his actual name was David, couldn't remember his name so he just called him Stringbean because of his appearance and he adopted the name and went by Stringbean there ever since. Now he ended up not making a living immediately playing music but he went into semi-professional baseball and met a man there named Bill Monroe who eventually put Stringbean in his band as the banjo player and Stringbean was a comedian also so he did banjo comedy and Bill Monroe was the founder of bluegrass. So that's why I wanted to start over here because it says here that in December of 1945, Grand Old Opry star Bill Monroe and his mandolin brought the Ryman Auditorium stage a band that created a new American musical form. With the banjo style of Earl Scruggs and the guitar of Lester Flatt, the new musical genre became known as bluegrass, augmented by the fiddle of Chubby Wise and the bass of Howard Watts, also known as Cedric Rainwater. This ensemble became known as the original bluegrass band, which became the prototype for groups that followed. And I was originally gonna show you that there was a Bill Monroe statue right here, but it's gone. See? Gonzo. Now you're probably thinking, wait a minute, Jordan, I thought you said the string bean was his banjo player. Well, he was. Scruggs replaced String Bean. String Bean played with Bill Monroe from 43 to 45. Here's the original epic front of the Ryman, which was the home of the Grand Old Opry at the time. So when String Bean quit playing with Bill Monroe, he joined a comedy duo with a man named William Egbert, and then eventually formed a comedy duo in 1946 with Grandpa Jones, and he and Grandpa Jones would do this banjo comedy act they would go on to be on Hee Haw together, perform here at the Ryman on the Grand Old Opry, and then they would become neighbors out where we're gonna to go to next. The home of Estelle and Stringbean. So we're gonna take the clock back to November 10th, 1973. 
String Bean would do a performance here, Grand Old Opry, and then he and Estelle would head home. So this purple building over here is Tootsie's. That's the back entrance to Tootsie's. And then here's a side entrance to the Ryman. Hank Williams got in trouble because when he was performing at the Ryman, he used to sneak out and pop over to Tootsie's and get drunk. So since he went by the name String Bean, he adapted his onstage wardrobe to kind of reflect that. So he would always wear a big long night shirt tucked into a short pair of jeans. So the jeans would realistically come to a little above his knees and then the night shirt would go all the way down and the belt would be down there above the knees. All right, there's our sign. All right, this is the road that takes you out to String Bean's house. Well, his cabin. See, he didn't believe in spending a lot of money and he also didn't believe in keeping any of his money in the bank because of what happened in the Great Depression. So the property behind me is where String Bean and Estelle lived and where they came home to that night after the Grand Old Opry. String Bean was beloved by everyone and no one ever saw what happened that night coming. No one ever anticipated anything like this out here. String Bean came home in their car and apparently String Bean noticed something was a little off and he always carried a 22 pistol on him. He drew out the pistol as he went in and they, like I said, never kept their money in a bank so he was always known to have a lot of money on him and a lot of people then assumed that the money, other monies, must be inside the house. So apparently two cousins, the Brown cousins, were waiting inside for String Bean and upon entering they shot him dead and then they came outside and Estelle was running towards the road. You can see there's a long winding pathway. She started running out here towards the road, looking for help, yelling for help. They came out, shot her. And then as she begged for her life, they shot her in the head and finished her. Absolutely unbelievable. Now it said that they took off in their car, took, the Browns took off in String Bean's car and had about $250 that they had found next to nothing. Killed these two people for that little amount of money. And like I said, the Aikmans were simple people. They just lived in this cabin house out here. They didn't have a mansion. They didn't have other properties or anything like that. And they were killed for a few guns, Estelle's purse, you know, $250 from String Beans overalls. And sadly, the person that found them was Grandpa Jones. I mentioned earlier that Grandpa Jones and String Bean were great friends. They were neighbors here, and all they were going to do the next day was go out on a fishing trip. That's basically what the, uh, the Aikmans spent their time doing, was going out, hanging out at creeks fishing. And Grandpa Jones, who had performed a String Bean for you know, almost 30 years through Hee Haw and the Grand Old Opry, showed up here to pick him up and found both of them here. Now. There was quite a bit more money on them that the robbers didn't know about because uh, String Bean and Estelle both had secret pockets sewn onto the inside of their clothes that they would keep thousands of dollars in. But both men were apprehended, both were given life sentences, one did die in prison, but I'll tell you what happened afterward. Let's go over and see the grave of David String Bean Aikman and Estelle Aikman. I often wonder when I come out to these sites if I'll ever find like a little makeshift memorial or anything, but nothing here. Unless it was once here and it's been removed.
here we are, Forest Lawn Cemetery. And String Bean is buried in Music Row. Music Row is this little strip that runs right along the center here on either side when you first drive in. So he should be right over here somewhere. I haven't seen him yet. This is cool. It says they were the inspiration for mom and dad's waltz. And of course they're talking about Lefty here. Lefty Frizzell. I love you a thousand ways. So right here as we pass by there's Judy Baker, country music's hostess. And then just a few vlogs ago, we talked about this guy, Harold Hawkshaw Hawkins, who passed away in the plane crash with Patsy Cline. He was a member of Patsy's band. And then right over here was the bluegrass boy, James Elrod, Jimmy Elrod. And right next to them is String Bean and Estelle. So, of course, the country community was beside itself after they passed because they had nothing but nice things to say about String Bean and Estelle. And afterward, both men, of course, like I said, were sentenced to death, or life in prison, anyway. A life in prison would generally mean death, but not in this case because one of them passed away, but John actually came up for parole. And despite String Bean's friends coming out and saying unequivocally they thought no mercy should be shown and that he should rot in prison, he was released. John was released. Now, in the 90s, the people that lived in the home that we were at found behind a brick thousands and thousands of dollars. None of them usable. They were all deteriorated by condition, but he said it was like $20,000 they found back there. What a sad story. And I mentioned they like to spend most of their life being humble and fishing out at the creek. You can see right underneath string beans, there's a banjo. And then it says together forever. They were married in uh, 1943, and then hers has the fishing pole. So sad. Senseless murder. Well, my friends, we're gonna call it a day. Hope you enjoyed this vlog. It was a sad one, but I don't want Stream Bean to be forgotten. And we got to see a little bit of the rhyme in, a little bit of music row. And unfortunately we saw where his life ended and where they rest eternally. Thank you for watching, have a great night. We'll see you all next time. From Tennessee, goodbye. Mm -hmm.